All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left of Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal uh, we are joined today by Professor Shantae Paradigm Smalls, Associate Professor of Black Studies in the Department of English and Faculty in Critical Race and Ethnic Studies at the St. John's University. They are the author of Hip Hop Heresies, Queer Aesthetics in New York City, published by New York University Press. Shantae and I are, in fact, label mates. Uh, and we both, as they have, have published in the series Postmillennial Pop, edited by our friends Karen Tongson and Henry Jenkins. Of Hip Hop Heresies, our friend Alexander Wahaley writes, finally, a deep, heavy sigh of relief, followed by okay. loud cheers of yes, yes, y'all. We have a book about New York City hip hop culture that is queerly heretical as the genre itself, challenging the cis hetero masculine narratives usually projected onto hip hop culture, Shantae Paradigm Smalls beautifully and heretically mashes up Black aesthetics, queer aesthetics, and hip-hop aesthetics. Hip-hop heresies is poised to irrevocably change the parameters of hip-hop scholarship. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm all right. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> so tell us how you traveled to this book. Wow. Um, yes, circuitously for sure, but also in some ways... <laughs> Inevitably, I think, um, uh, you know, this this book is really a culmination of or at least a, like a nodal point of my, of my love affair with hip hop, which started when I was five years old. I heard my heard my first hip hop record, which was uh, uh, Curtis Blow um, basketball. So um <laughs> of my cousin older cousins were playing that record and you know to my young ears it just sounded like nothing obviously i'd ever heard basketball is my favorite sport i like the way to dribble up and down the court just like i'm the king on the microphone so it's dr j and moses malone i, like I was uh i became a hip-hop fan and um you know growing up in the northeast between new york city and connecticut i really got to see and meet and be in a lot of uh, hip hop as it emerged, I felt like I felt like I was like kind of the right age. I was a little young, but also, um, you know, got to really experience, um, you know, hip hop as it grew up and continue to experience it. So um, I, I did. I was I, I dabbled in a lot of different hip hop arts. Uh, I was a dancer, a little hip hop art, a little b girl when I was a, was a kid. Um, beatboxer, uh, and I DJed for a while in college, and then. Um, in college, I had a little hip hop group and we um, started making music, just kind of playing around. And then after college, I, I ended up, you know, getting more serious about that. I had a group, BQE, and we made a, a couple of albums and was in a couple of films. And, you know, it was really interesting um, uh, being in sort of early or mid, you know, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, uh, mid 2000s iterations of queer hip hop. And then, uh, you know, I ended up going to graduate school and I was like, this is, I think I want to understand this more deeply. You know, I want to understand this from a sort of historical and critical social and uh, cultural uh, perspective. And, you know, I thought I was going to write more about, you know, gay artists, but it ended up being more broadly about, uh, about these art movements um, and about this kind of aesthetic uh, relationship, uh, queer aesthetic relationship to hip hop in New York City. So it was it was somewhat securitous, but it, looking back, it feels like kind of everything was stacked up. Organic, yes. Yeah, it's very organic. Uh, yes. You throw down the gauntlet really early in the book and saying that this is an attempt to divest us in hip hop of the narrative of Black Latinx male authenticity. And so much of hip hop, you know, as it's been talked about in the popular realm, is about seeing hip hop as a kind of ground zero for a certain authenticity of blackness, no doubt, obviously black maleness. You're kind of changing the frame here, arguing that there are other ways to talk about authenticity when we talk about hip hop. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think in part, I wanted to think about, you know, I think authenticity 
has its uses, obviously. But I think when authenticity comes into the relationship, uh, particularly with Black masculinity and the market, you know, what it, what it does, and you know, you, you know, your book, your previous book before your current book, um, you know, really helped me to articulate this, but, you know, it ends up really um, compressing what Black men can be. Mm -hmm. or the black mm -hmm. male imagination, you know, because it's like, uh, here are the approved three or four <laughs> approved, um, you know, uh, archetypes, you know, that change over, over time and with decades, but they, they often be, they often end up being the least imaginative, right. And the right. most right. Kind of damaging, um, and, and the kind of, the kind of least elastic, right. And other, other kinds of masculinities get to play in ways that, you know, black men are often told they cannot for a variety of reasons, white supremacy and, and white supremacist ideas of masculine and feminine and, and, you know, internal pressures, our own internal pressures around survival. And so I wanted to like, you know, move, uh, move some of that or participate in the conversation by saying, well, hey, what about, what about other kind? what about other forms of uh, uh, prowess? Like, you know, your abilities, you know, your, 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 <laughs> your MC abilities or your poetry abilities or your graffiti abilities or your dance abilities and not going so much into solidifying that into, you know, we're really captivated by I, really limited ideas of gender, by gender in, in, in particular. And gender, you know, mm -hmm. Sylvia Winter, you know, told us is, is a genre and it's a genre that is very, very, very small for uh, black folks in the in the US in particular. And you know, part of that is because we're cut off from our, our you know, uh, historical uh, uh, ideas of gender, which aren't you know, managed by the same way that Europeans you know, manage yeah. their ideas of gender, right? So, you know, but here we are, right, in the 20th, 21st century, trying to articulate ourselves inside of all these management systems. And I just want to be another voice that says, hey, look at what people are already doing. And you know, I say that this is this is a kind of way of you know slipping and sliding between certain um, um, the cracks of certain kinds of the weight of race and gender and sexuality and 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 the rigid the rigidity of authenticity. You know, you have so, to do it this way in order right. to be real. And because the real in hip hop changes so frequently, <laughs> it also changes <laughs> is different by region. Yeah. It's different by decade. It's different by region. It's different by you know old school, new school, and that has changed. You know who the people who used to be new school are now old school. Old school. You know, and so the the battles continue. So it's like, hey, this ground is shifting all the time. Anyway, let's stop trying to say this is what it. You know, this is the authentic. You know, black masculinity. Yeah, I remember reading Tim and Wes years ago. Um, writing about queer hip hop. And, and yeah. one of the things he talked about is that when we go back and we try to recuperate the early days of hip hop, right? Because so much of early hip hop scholarship was, let's go tell the story the right way, right? The way it really happened, right? right. Um, you, you know, your citation of Nelson George's piece, right? You know, sitting down with the hip hop elders. Yeah. But one of the things that Tim and <laughs> that Tim and always said, excuse me, was that we can't presume to know those early figures the way that we think that they we know them. that's right that's right Right now first of all there wasn't even a media apparatus for us to know them that way in the ways that we might think that we know beyonce now and don't really know her either right, exactly um but for you you know given that kind mm -hmm. of framework you know what kind of archives did you look for to really tell this story i mean as you said a moment ago this was not so much about identifying the queer bodies in history yeah. but talking about a queer aesthetic right which really opens it up in a in a wider way for yes. who we can discuss and what we can discuss that also gets claimed as hip-hop that's right i mean i you know some of some of the uh archive was uh had to do with my uh investments and who i love so, you know, Jean Grey, uh, one of my favorite, and well, she now calls her, I just saw her on Instagram post today. She was like, former MC, former rapper, <laughs> Jean Grey. So, okay. So, uh, Jean Grey, love her. And uh, in my dissertation, I actually had a chapter on Jay-Z, which fell out of the book in some ways because um, so much had happened between <laughs> the, when the book, the dissertation was finished and when I was the book revising out, yeah. the book. Yeah. yeah. So it's like lemonade happened and then 444 happened. And then 
uh, plays at the table happened. I was like, okay, I have to write about those three albums together. <laughs> right. I can't. So I was like, I just can't, you know, I can't um, get that all in. Um, and and it was it was sort of perfectly idiosyncratic in the dissertation, but in the book, it it started not to feel uh, right. workable. So um, and then I had an ethnograph. I interviewed people. You know, I interviewed people, and I also had done um, a number of years of putting to, uh, curating. Uh, um, LGBTQ uh, music uh, sort of conferences. So at first it was just like performances, you know, music, uh, film, dance. And then we expanded it to be part of um, academics. We had you know, lectures and we had mm -hmm. stuff with community-based organizations. And so that that archive, and then, um, you know, I, <laughs> I took a class, uh, an archive class, and we met when I was a graduate student at NYU, and we met in the Bobes Library in the New York, in the downtown archives. And in that archive, I stumbled upon Martin Paul. So I'm always grateful to Tavian Youngo for that class. And then the uh, uh, last chapter, the, the the chapter on Barry Gordy's Last Dragon, you know, I, I came to that because I was thinking about early hip hop film. A martial arts champion in search of the glow a madman shogun of Harlem. and i was i was thinking about you know uh the shift from films in the 80s to the 90s you know so the 80s was like well, was kind of wild there was a lot of uh semi um documentaries so you know crush groove right. breaking right. you know so forth and and uh you know um, wild style and then of course style wars which was an actual documentary and then the 90s was more like L.A. gritty, you know, like uh, <laughs> menace to society. And, you know, right. Right. Boys in the hood. hood. Boys right. in the yep. hood. It just was like, OK. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was like, The Last Dragon is just quirky. And I was it, that came out of I was thinking about this Afro-Asian connection. Right. And so that's how it really it really came about. And then putting it together, then I had to find a through line, you know, and I was like, huh, queer aesthetics, you know. So that was um, and I felt like that was something that was more accessible. Uh, that people could wrap their head around, could ask questions about, could maybe push back on, um, and and it felt like something that that would uh, engender conversation. Yeah, I, I want to get back to Martin Wong in a moment, but I, I want to stay with the Last Dragon for for a second. Um, you know, it's it's an odd film. Yes. Odd that it's a Motown film, and particularly oh, that yes. moment at Motown when Motown just doesn't matter the same way. <laughs> <laughs> that mm -hmm. it did in previous decades, right? The sign outside says this here school is for instructions in the martial arts. So we thought we might get some lessons. Yeah, when we sign up. How many? Yeah. I like to learn some kung fu. Come on, hot stuff. Come on, Leroy. Teach me something. I do not wish to fight you. But it's also this moment before Wu Tang. Yeah. Uh, and, yes. and it kind of elaborates on what has been, you know, living in New York City Saturday afternoon watching, you know, Bruce Lee flicks. That's yes. why Wu-Tang is Wu-Tang. And to yeah. some extent, that's why, you know, The Last Dragon even makes sense. The tag's over, boy. Talk a little bit about the film for the audience who aren't familiar, right? Because it is kind of like a, a ghetto classic. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a B movie. It's a cult classic for sure. It is a very intense cult following on the internet, particularly on Twitter, but also Facebook. And um, you know, I interviewed the director of and the writer of that film, Louis Vanesta, and he had he had a lot to say. Some that was would not be for public uh, consumption, but <laughs> Motown came on at the very, very, very end, and Barry Gordy put his name on the film, so that he wasn't really involved in the film until wow. you know the end. And so um, the film is about. It's a very. It's based basically on. It's like Black Bruce Lee, but a comedy. Okay. Right. And it's based on uh, this character, Bruce Leroy, um, Leroy Green, <laughs> Bruce Leroy Green, who grows is a Harlem kid uh, starring Time Mac and uh, Vanity is plays his love interest. Yes. And so it's this it's this kind of it's this kind of like mishmash of uh, of like Shaw Brothers films of seven, 60s and 70s and 80s martial arts films where this Harlem kid trains with his. Uh, master and he has to go find the last dragon. He has to find the last part of his training. 
basically his 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 sifu teacher like you have to go into the real world (laughs) and um, he encounters (laughs) he encounters all these different things um and it's interesting because the character is not like a black exploitation martial arts right he's very soft-spoken he's very meek he kind of like takes on that persona are you all right miss yeah yeah i don't know i guess so what about you are you okay they did not harm me that tradition of chinese um masculine um martial arts performance and um and so he finds a girlfriend he finds friends he finds community he realizes he defeats the bad guys and he realizes that it's not about being so rigid it's actually about like exploring the world and he can have he can have integration and it's and it's like you know stereotype heaven it's not pc at all (laughs) and it's um but it's also funny and it's very interesting and it's it's an enjoyable film you know it it goes a little bit off the rails um but you have the you know (laughs) you have um you know so that's that's the film and you can you can watch it anyway it has a kind of a quirky soundtrack too so uh, uh same director who did crush groove and car wash and coolie high and so michael schultz a, michael yeah. schultz michael yeah schultz, so michael yeah. schultz is <laughs> michael schultz is keeps it from going too far off the rails you know he's able he's able to play up the comic and he has experience with like this multi-genre right uh so it's a very it, it came out in 1985 and it did quite well actually in the box office and then it became this cult classic <laughs> and it was really and it's really the only thing that time Mac ever made and a few years ago, it was like the 25th anniversary or something. And there was a big thing in New York or the 30th anniversary. And, you know, he was like, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, and then if you go back, one of Buster Rhymes did do a, a video some years back where he played, he had the Shogun of Harlem outfit right. on. Right. So right. it's a very, um, it's a very complex film in a lot of ways because it's trying to, uh, uh, I think articulate, at least what I say is that, is that, you know, race is very fluid in this world. And that's something that Louis Vanessa was very interested in because he said, you know, he would go to, when he was a kid growing up and uh, I think he's, he grew up in Hell's Kitchen maybe. And he would see, you know, everyone would be at the, everyone would be there at the, watching the movies in the movie theater. And they would all, all be practicing Kung Fu or karate. Right. And And it was a it was a New York City that he knew in the 70s and early 80s that he wanted to put on on film. You talk early in the book about why this had to be a New York book. Mm. There there, there are other cities that perhaps have produced the same kind of queer narratives or queer aesthetics. But there was something very specific about New York that you wanted to double down on. Yeah, I think. You know, I had to think about this. Did I want to write a book that was about queer hip hop? Did I want to write the history of queer hip hop? And and that's not what I wanted to do. Right. And actually, a right. book is coming out in a week, I think, uh, off Michigan. Uh, Lauren Kerr wrote a is, wrote a book on, um, I think it's something like the gay the gay history of hip hop or something like that. So okay. I think she she really did that that book, and uh, and you know, I thought about like you know writing about uh, L A where this this group um the first group that i've been able to find uh uh that was an uh lgbt or gay hip-hop group um and then um san francisco bay area was right. they were the ones who really produced you know you talk about tim and west deep Dip collective deep and Tickle, all right. rainbow right. flavor and they you right. know they those are the ones they were the ones who really jump-started this queer hip-hop movement uh of the late of the 90s and the early 2000s and so um I realized I wanted to write about New York because I wanted to not just write about rap music. And so I could write about film and I could write about, uh, although Breaking was set in LA, but I could write about film and I could write about visual art and I could write about ethnography. And I thought that was really important to go deep and ground it in, um, uh, and also say like, okay, so New York is, this is this is the birthplace of contemporary hip hop. And I wanted to say, then we're going to place this in New York City, right? <laughs> and and we're going to see what New York City produces. And I think because of all the industries in right. the, in this city, there uh, the influences were there, right? They were the people were there. You know, it wasn't just um, gay designers or makeup artists, but it was DJs and rappers and dancers, and they were 
you know, they were there um, because they were in the art scene. That was, if you go, you know, rappers were coming or MCs were coming, you know, they were going everywhere. And so, you know, they were in the downtown art scene or they were in Brooklyn or they were in the Bronx. And so really kind of trying to demonstrate that that was integral to um, early hip hop culture. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the significance of the subways, right? I mean, New York is a cosmopolitan city and the subway makes it even more cosmopolitan because yes. of the way that you can travel, yes. you know, through the boroughs. Yes, it's really possible. And, you know, something that I always think is really funny People think of New Yorkers as very sophisticated, and, and that's true. There are some New Yorkers who are very sophisticated, but there are also a lot of New Yorkers who are quite provincial. They've never left their borough. You know, it's a yeah. big it's a big adventure to like get on the train and go to another borough. They're like, what? What? I don't know anything. And you're like, okay. You know, so so that was part of how people really um uh found adventure was going to going to, you know, the Bronx, the Brooklyn, what, you know, going to another borough or going to Manhattan, right? That was a big, that was the the city, you know, and so I think in some ways it the subway helps to facilitate a kind of um, a kind of local exploration yeah. Of, yeah. of of New York art life, right? That that yeah. not necessarily everyone who lives here gets to explore. Um, so the subway, you know, now it's two seventy five, but you know, then it was I don't know a quarter or something. something and so it, <laughs> so it's it's like you know you grew up here, so it's like it helps to uh, it helps folks to like get out of their um, you know, the subways, are, and also the subway, I didn't talk about this, but the subway is also a place where hip hop happened, right. you know, particularly right. graffiti, most recognizably, you know, people tagging trains inside and out, but also performers, you know, people right. now, you know, we, the Showtime guys, I don't know what's happened to them in, in the pandemic, but um, Showtime and they're flipping and doing all kinds of crazy stuff on moving trains is amazing, but also rappers, you know, singers, Right. So the subway also functions as an entertainment space and a performance <laughs> space. Um, and now, you know, the city over the last 15, 20 years, now they have official places where you can sign up and you can perform in subways, in subway stations, you know, and you have your little MTA performer sign behind you and that. So the so you, get your, you get your free entertainment. So, you know, the subway itself uh, is a site of uh, hip hop innovation. Hip -hop, performance. Yeah. 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 You mentioned graffiti, uh, Martin Wong. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about this figure who's probably not remembered enough yes. in terms of early hip hop history, particularly even hip hop visual culture. Right. Um, but who is Martin Wong? You know, Martin Wong was a um, self-taught uh, painter um, and um, ceramicist and graffiti artist and, um, and basically a kind of like a mini, uh, a local curator um, he, uh, in the Lower East Side of East Village, he moved to um, New York in 1975 from San Francisco. He wanted to be an artist and he um, ended up on the Lower East Side. And, you know, back in then, Lower East Side, you know, he, he kind of, he got jumped in because they were like, gritty, who is gritty, this gritty. Asian? Yeah, they were like, who's this Asian cat? It was a Puerto Rican black neighborhood. Who's this Asian cat? You know, he wasn't living in Chinatown or, you know, so he got jumped in and they were like, okay, you're cool. And he um, <laughs> and he was this gay Chinese American dude who was a, a really amazing prolific artist. Um, he has art in the De Young Museum in San Francisco and the Met, PPO Gallery has his, mm -hmm. has his art and also, and then the Museum of the City of New York has, have all his photographs. And then of course, NYU Bobes has um, his, his papers. So um, he had these connections with people we would maybe know their art, if not their names. The Ahern brothers who did, you know, Charlie Ahern did Wild Style. Right, they, were, right. they were connects. Miguel Pinero, they were right. connects, possibly lovers. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> hush hush around that. Um, but we know Miguel Pinero was, you know, bisexual. And so he had connections to the like New Yorkian poets. He had connections to... He put on like Lady Pink, Days, Crash, Zephyr, all these people. He helped yeah, to get yeah. their art in um, in museums and in galleries. So when they would be feeling the heat from the MTA or from the police, from the Metropolitan Transportation Authority or the police, they could also do shows both in the U.S. and beyond. So he he also collected this art because he felt it was going to have great value, and it and it, it does, and it has. You know, so there maybe. Graffiti might be 
I want to say graffiti was really uh, hip rapping was written about early on. I mean, maybe as early as the you know early eighties, but graffiti was definitely written about not necessarily by yeah. academics, but by right. artists. Art so critics graffiti, and artists, yeah, yeah, critics, art. So art, people were writing about graffiti on the late seventies and the early eighties, um, and and producing books. And so Martin Wong kind of he had this vision, and he saw he didn't want these artists to just be. Um, inspiration for kind of like white middle-class artists or get ripped off or right or they or them die and then their art gets sold for millions of dollars and the money goes to you know some private collector so he there was a there was a short uh uh lived museum of american graffiti uh, there is now a museum of graffiti in miami which started a few years ago but he had the first museum of graffiti uh on bond street and, um, you know, he really saw a vision um, where graffiti could be taken seriously as an art form. So I, I really credit him with also building the bridge between graffiti art, street art, and uh, graffiti mm -hmm. in uh, institutions of, you know, of, of art and visual. You use this term in the book, queer dissonance. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you unpack that? <laughs> You know, queer dissonance um, is really about the disruptive sonic qualities that are, are possible um, or disruptive sounds or disruptive musical um, uh, interventions. And um, it, it has to do with, uh, in some ways it has to do with being you know, LGBTQ artists and the kinds of things that they say or speak. But it also can be, um, it also could be street artists who I think there's a long footnote in there mm -hmm. where I talk about the um, uh, how does the untitled how does it feel video from D'Angelo in right. what 2000. And I would say that was an instance of queer dissonance. I mean, that was visual. Absolutely. But, but it, Absolutely. it disrupted kind of seamless pleasures. Absolutely. Um, uh, and it kind of inverted inverted the sexualized uh, gaze. And I mm -hmm. remember being on um, like BET's, BET.com and people being like, Dudes being like, you're not gonna turn me into no faggot, <laughs> and like, and like, just having to look at the angel's body <laughs> was like so destabilizing. <laughs> oh, 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 this facial expressions, right? Oh, it's like, right. We, we, we hear dudes coming all the time in like yeah, Marvin right. Gaye songs That's and right. stuff like that. That's right. We never get to see them. See come. them. <laughs> Right. And then, and then it's, and it's just him. Right. And then the rumors like he was getting ahead of, who knows, probably because he's the Angelo who knows what he's doing. Right. Um, but also like, uh, um, you know, Andre 3000 said this went on, uh, a come and I, where he's talking, I'll come and I, where he's talking about, um, you know, don't get the wrong imp the impression of expression. Right. And so because it's these musical oddities, you know, mi mixing, mashing, um, genres and um, uh, sound qualities and tempos and flows that kind of disrupts the like uh, capitalist packaging of hip hop music. Yeah. And, uh, and it, also it sparks a conversation, right? So it's not just a musical piece that's interesting because there are a lot of those, like for a while I was writing about Prince Paul's uh, psychoanalysis, what is it? But no one listened to that album, you know what I mean? I mean, if they had, it would be, you know, that'd be awesome. Um, but it's something that kind of like shakes up the, uh, it's like a zeitgeist, right? And it's something that gets people talking. I would say WAP is an example of queer dissonance, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, when you have Fox News <laughs> reciting the lyrics of WAP, you're like, what's going on here? You know, uh, yeah. And, and it's funny, right? Because, you know, we just went through this summer where, you know, Beyonce and Drake both do quote unquote house records. And yeah. and we talk about it in a way, and and you do talk about it that we forget, you know, 
Queen Latifah is coming to my house, right? Even more significantly in this context, we forget about the Jungle, Fro- Jungle Brothers. Brothers yeah. Girl, I'll house you, which in many folks were introduced to the Jungle Brothers in that context. Before we That's knew right. about a De La That's Soul right. or right. Tribe Called Quest, we knew That's about right. Girl, I'll house you. We knew about Girl, I'll house you. And there's, I mean, someone has to write this, but the, the connections between house and hip hop are so significant. And, it, and they both come from disco, right? Which is, right. you know, really interesting. And some people will say, okay, yeah, they'll trace, they'll trace house music to disco, black music, but there's a little bit of shame in the hip hop, even though the right. first right. Hip, recorded hip hop album was a disco, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> Sheik's, you know, uh, song. And so it's like, uh, it's like, it's like, uh, so you have these, these cousins, right? Or even siblings right. and, um, and, and, and hip hop artists, particularly early hip hop or, you know, hip hop in its teenage years were house heads, but hip hop right. artists now are house heads too. Black people right. love, we love our house right. music. So right. this is something that because house music is not, and I hope it stays this way, frankly, because house music is not commodifiable the same way that hip hop yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, a house party or how, you know, that's like, 10 hours and you're dancing and you're sweating <laughs> and you, you, you know, the songs are 10 minutes long and you know, you're the remix, the 25 remixes. And so it's a different kind of investment. It's a different kind of investment in music and it's a different kind of, uh, there's a different longitude and there's a different audience. The audience is older for house music. So I'll be interested to see, particularly Beyonce, you know, everyone kind of, I don't know, Drake, dropped his album at a bad time because then right <laughs> but he's on the Beyonce album so okay but um you know and Drake has been messing with house music because he uh what was the album but he had like black coffee when he did right you know, right right get together so black coffee is this amazing South African um DJ, right. producer house, yep. house producer house DJ you know and so you ha- and and then on Beyonce's album you know a lot of the I don't know the, the dream did like I don't know three or four or five songs so the dream is also like crossing those boundaries between house and hip hop all the time. So it'll be really interesting to see if people become interested in house music. Um, And the other thing about house music I really like is that house music like reggae or like dance hall, the songs, even though they were made like 20 years ago, people play them like they're today's hits. Because you put on, you put on that song and people go wild. Like it's like very traditional (laughs) in that way, you know? So you, you know, people are still playing, you know, you used to hold me, you know, all that, like it's a new song. So I like that about house music. And I, I think one of the things that I got excited about in this book was saying like, uh, I, I think one of the worst things that has happened to hip hop is that black people have, we've allowed it, we've allowed other people to tell our stories to us. And so one of the things I was thinking about when I was writing this book was I was thinking about kids I knew in middle school whose parents made, made sure they knew who the Beatles were and Led Zeppelin. These mm-hmm. kids were 10 and 11 years old. Mm-hmm. What the hell about mm-hmm. some Beatles and Led Zeppelin? And then they were going mm-hmm. to see the Beatles and Led Zeppelin when they were 17. Oh, not the Beatles, obviously, John Lennon was dead, but they were going to right. see Led right. Zeppelin and the Doors and who are Jim Morrison. And, who, and, I, and I thought, are we going, going the same to, you thing. Know, yeah. you know, and I remember uh, maybe my first or second year at St. John's, the students, the Haraya, the Black student group Haraya got... Um, or one of the black student groups got Nas, Queen's own. And someone mm-hmm. was like, oh, he's old. I said, oh, Nasir <laughs> Jones is coming to St. John's and you want some, you don't want some, you know, you want some like contemporary person who won't even, you won't even remember their name in five years, you know? So, so th- that kind of longevity or that kind of investment in, uh, you know, the scene, not not seeing hip hop or not experiencing hip hop as disposable, you know. Yeah. So I do see now, like my students, for instance, particularly the black students and the students of color, they're like, oh yeah, my parents and sometimes their grandparents are hip hop heads. Right. So they so they're like, my favorite group is Tribe Called Quest. I'm like, you're 18, and they're like, right. well, how do, how do you know this? Right. But it's like my niece. It's like my niece. She's nine years old. My bro- her favorite group is Wu Tang. Because my brother, <laughs> Wu Tang, Wu Tang is for the children. So you now have like three generations, you know, who are and I that I really I think that's what the the, the preservation is happening yeah. in that in that level. Just like you know, my parents played you know Marvin Gaye for me or Ella Fitzgerald or you know right, things to right. their generation, and I love that music. Yeah. 
since you mentioned hip hop, I guess we kind of have to go here, right? You know, you're a hip hop scholar. Um, you just made this incredible contribution to what we call hip hop studies. Do you get weary about talking about hip hop on a day like this when we're talking, for example, you know, when when takeoff has been Ooh. the victim of senseless, senseless violence? Right. And, you know, say what you want to say about Migos. They were fun. They made good music. People are going to be listening to Bad and Bougie 25 years from now. You can't say that about a lot of contemporary you really hip hop. Yeah. But do you get weary, you know, having to deal with and unpack all the stuff that comes with being a hip hop scholar? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, there's, there's a question I've been answering for like over 20 years, which is, when is hip hop not going to be homophobic and sexist anymore? And I was like, well, when is the United States not going to be homophobic? Right. You know, right. when is the U.S. government? You know, hip hop's not making any laws. Hip hop is hip hop doesn't make it illegal for you to live your life. You know, <laughs> right. I said, you know, we may say some words, but at the end of the day, I'll keep it real. People are really cool, you know. Right. And right. I think there's been a lot of change you know all these hip hop artists with gay parents and i'm like okay right so right now i understand why y'all were saying you know and people and it's changed you know like gender and sexuality is very different now hip hop artists are like i'm queer or i i don't care or you know kendrick Lamar making his crazy song auntie whatever but i said you know the thing i said is what other pop genre who's making songs about their trans relatives right absolutely you can Absolutely. say what you want about Kendrick Lamar. I mean, you know, not so, but no, no one's even trying to do that. So, you know, I always see hip hop artistry as avant-garde. Now, at the same time, you know, I think hip hop reveals something that we forget about entertainment in general, which is that the entertain all of the entertainment industries are entwined with criminal elements. <laughs> so yeah. we just have to go back to, you know, the Rat Pack and all those people. Right. Oh, Frank Sinatra. Okay, well, who was Frank Sinatra beholden to? <laughs> you know, so, and not to say that Takeoff's uh, death was about that, but I think that, you know, when it happens to Black people, it's like indicative of some something wrong with us. Right, right. Black on Black crime. When it happens, when a white person um, overdoses or absconds with a minor, Ezra Miller, or, or, or <laughs> Jerry, Lee Lewis. <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis, or kill someone, it's, oh, a tragedy. And, you know, and in some ways, it's almost like, um, there's, we don't, we don't want to mourn, we just want to go to like our, you know, yeah. Moynihanian explanation of black pathology. And I think that, you know, social media, and the speed of things in general in the world has made us so quick to someone being shot when they weren't even involved and, you know, over a dice game, shot and killed. And, and then, you know, I think off, was offset shot as well? Or Quavo, Quavo. So, you know, it's like, this is horrible. This is actually yeah. not okay. This is not, right. take off is 28 years old. Right, you know? right. And, and I think that, you know, because people think they know what hip hop is, they just say, oh, that's that's hip hop. That's what happens. That's it's like, right. no, it's like, no, right. this is this is indicative of this is indicative of the problems of authenticity, authentic masculinity, actually. Right. right. And, and, uh, and indicative of the problem of, you know, loose gun laws. Right. That, that other piece of it also. Right. You know, and just just, you know, people. I mean, I know this is old school, but it's like we used to settle things with our hands. You know, you, right. you lived. Right. You right. may have gotten beaten down, you know, <laughs> and embarrassed in the process, and embarrassed and a broken right. job, but you didn't, you know, you didn't die. And also, on the other end of that, you didn't, you didn't at a young age re take someone's life and then regret um, because this is everyone's destroyed in this situation, you know. Right. Uh, right. Takeoff lost his life, but his whole family's and the person who shot there, it's over, you know, their whole life is, right. you know, and so that those things are. Um, are so painful. And I think it's just much easier to say, oh, black on black crime, which, you know, this racist yeah. um, construct or that's hip hop. And I think, you know, and I know you know this, you know, being a hip hop scholar, people think that means you don't, because hip hop is contextual. You know, I always tell people, listen to a hip hop album. 
And that will t- that hip hop that album or even sometimes that song is going to give you a whole history lesson. Right. It's going to give you it's going to give you context. Listen to people talk, producers in particular, or sometimes even artists talk about their thought process, and they're going to take you back a hundred years, or they're going to take you <laughs> forward a hundred years, or they're going to talk right. about records their grandparents are listening to. And so there's there's um we actually have to know a lot not just about hip hop, but about black culture, about the US, about um, sound, about production. Um, you know, I was like, I tell people my my work goes all the way back to the uh, 1800s. You know, that's when I start, cause I, that's when popular culture really shifted in the US, you know, post, um, post bellum, post reconstruction. So, you know, I sometimes get tired of the way that when it's convenient, hip hop, uh, is a shorthand for Black people's failings, right. and then when it's and then when it's also convenient, it's like, oh no, hip hop's for everyone. No, 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 that's our music, <laughs> and we let y'all we let y'all participate. But this is this is Black music, and I do feel that maybe this is you know not politically correct, but I do feel that Black people could do more gatekeeping around our cultural products and around our cultural heritage that other people do the same thing. You don't right. see everyone making, uh, you know, Chinese opera dance or something or or, right. or even martial arts films where you don't, right. you, you know, you don't see the, the level of expertise. Everyone's not giving away our secrets, you know, their secrets the same way I think we do. And I think hip hop scholars, you know, we're made to feel sometimes, or people try to make us feel like we're not smart basically, or our work doesn't have any intellectual depth. And um, you know, we now we have the benefit of, you know, 40 years of hip hop scholarship. Yeah. And it's across, you know, across disciplines, interdisciplinary. We have people have scholarships. There are programs. We have A.D. Mm-hmm. Carson who made a, you know, album. And, <laughs> you know, and so I, I think, you know, I, I think on days like this, it is um, it is easier to kind of do that kind of nonsense than to actually mourn and to also think about uh you know i've been thinking a lot about uh you know all the gen x uh hip-hop men who've been dying yeah and how you know and just like you know black men deserve to live a long time you know to die of old age and so you know i think those kinds of discussions are do bubble up in times like this, you know, I've been seeing a little bit of that on the black uh, Twitter and black social media, black Instagram. And so we'll see, you know, but um, I'm really grateful to, um, you know, to hip hop scholarship. And I'm sort of like curious about what's next. I am, I am working on a little tiny hip hop. Um, I'm working on a second book that doesn't have anything to do with hip hop. Um, (laughs) except there's hip-hop stuff in there um i'm writing about flying lotus in one chapter Mm -hmm. and i'm writing about Mm -hmm. uh maybe young ma in another chapter and um uh, it has to do with science fiction but um you know but there's music there's music i'm writing about patty labelle and uh uh, sananda mayatreya formerly known as terence Trent darby so um but i'm curious about how my own hip-hop um scholarship and interests will evolve, you know, post this book. So I am writing about Young M.A., um, who I don't talk about much in the book, a little bit. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see, you know, uh, how that comes along as well. Comes next. Yeah. The book is Hip Hop Heresies, Queer Aesthetics in New York City, published by New York University Press. We've been in conversation today with Professor Shante Paradigm Smalls. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. Buy my book. (laughs) (laughs) Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.